This episode of Basics with Babish is brought to you by itself. The Basics with Babish cookbook hits shelves and your mailbox in less than two weeks. Get tickets now for my book tour. I'm stopping in New Jersey, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, Toronto, DC, Los Angeles, and St. Louis. Head to bingingwithbabish.com slash book tour. All right, so for our cinnamon roll dough, we're gonna start by making a tangzhong, a cooked paste of flour and water that's gonna help our rolls retain moisture as well as delay the staling process. In a small saucepan, we're combining 150 milliliters of water with 30 grams of all-purpose flour, cooking and whisking constantly over medium heat to prevent clumping and scorching until it almost has the consistency of frosting and reaches 175 degrees Fahrenheit. Then we're bringing this mixture over to our awaiting stand mixer and placing it in the bowl, still steaming hot, and then we're adding 165 ml of cold buttermilk, just a few splashes at a time while the mixer's running to start so it doesn't get lumpy. The resultant tepid mixture should make for a nice environment for our yeast to thrive. Once you get a nice smooth mixture, we're gonna add 450 grams of all-purpose flour, 50 grams of granulated sugar, two teaspoons of kosher salt, and one packet or two and a quarter teaspoons of instant yeast. We're also gonna add two eggs, which I learned the hard way, you might wanna crack into a bowl first. If you drop a little piece of eggshell into the flour, you might nuke your whole batch. Beat up those eggs a little bit, add them to the bowl, affix dough hooks, and apply low mixing speed to start, speeding up to medium once things come together and kneading for about two minutes. If things are looking a little too much like pancake batter, now's a good time to add flour one tablespoon at a time. Once you have a dough that just barely clears the sides of the bowl, we're gonna add 70 grams of unsalted room temperature butter one tablespoon at a time, waiting until each piece disappears completely into the dough before adding the next. This brioche-like process is gonna give our rolls a brioche-like buttery richness. Once all the butter's been added, we're gonna let this guy go on medium speed for about six minutes. This stand mixer is violently shaking my table, so I'm gonna put it on the floor, let it knead until it forms a supple, bouncy dough, place it back on the table, start it back up and the audience will never know the difference. The dough should be quite hydrated, but not sticky. You should be able to pull it down off the hook without all of it sticking to your hands. Now it needs to proof, so I'm bowl scraping it into a well-oiled lidded container, covering it up and letting it rest for one to two hours until it's doubled in size. If it's a little chilly in your kitchen, you can proof in the oven. Just turn on the oven light, not the oven itself, and let it reach a balmy, roughly 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Check on it every 15 minutes or so because those oven lights are hotter than you think. Once our dough has been bedoubled, we're generously oiling or non-stick spraying our work surface, turning out our big, bouncy, jiggly, bubbly batch of dough. I have a feeling this is going to look satisfying. Oh yeah, somehow as delicious as it is alien looking. Now with well-oiled hands and a rolling pin, we're going to roll it out to a rectangle roughly 12 by 20 inches, with the rectangle facing you widthwise, because counterintuitively that's the direction that we're going to roll. First, we're buttering things up with 60 grams of butter, unsalted and at room temperature for easy spreading, but if it's not spreading as easily as you'd like, feel free to channel Jamie Lee Curtis from that one episode of The Bear, and just spread the butter around using your hands. Probably not the most professional thing in the world, but it works really, really well. Plus, you get to go around your house and make the same joke to all of its occupants that you now have butter fingers. Now, the butter's obviously going to add a lot of flavor, but it's also going to act as a glue for our spice mixture. A simple and elegant combination of 80 grams of granulated sugar, 50 grams of light brown sugar, and one and a half tablespoons of ground cinnamon. I'm sprinkling this evenly over the butter by virtue of a fine mesh sieve, holding it just so you can't see it. This both helps to spread it evenly and filters out any brown sugar chunks. And now from the bottom edge upward, we're going to start rolling into a tight log. Sort of go back and forth like a typewriter if you have any idea what one of those is. Roll it up evenly and gently pinch the seam shut. Scoot it over seam side down and it's time to carve this turkey. First, we're going to slice off the ends so we have nice clean cuts on all of our rolls. You can bake these up separately for a little chef snack. And now, we're going to eyeball it into 12 equal pieces, doing this by placing a marker directly in the center, then another marker halfway between the center and the edge, and then two markers between those. If you want more professional results, as it is so often said, use a ruler. Now we're going to slice these up and place them in our prepared pan, which I forgot to prepare. Standard issue 9 by 13 casserole, generously sprayed down with nonstick spray, and lined with a sheet of parchment paper. This is going to help us extract the rolls once they're baked. I'm placing a harsh crease in the paper right on the edge of the pan to keep it out of my dang way, and then 
then slicing and arranging my rolls in the pan in a grid three wide and four long. Now if you rolled out the dough thin enough and twisted it up tight enough, there should be plenty of room between the rolls, which they're going to need because they're going to grow dramatically during the second rise. All we got to do is cover them up with some well-oiled plastic wrap, and if you want to eat these the same day, you can let them rise for an hour before baking, or you can cover them tightly with plastic wrap and place them in the fridge overnight. This has the added benefits of an improved flavor and texture, plus the ability to bake and serve these suckers first thing in the morning. As soon as you wake up, take them out of the cold closet, which is a new name I just came up with for fridge, and let them sit out for an hour to an hour and a half until they've grown by about 50%. Sorry for not wearing an apron, I know that that's off-putting, but it is genuinely morning and I am genuinely not awake. We got a preheated 375 degree Fahrenheit oven where these guys are headed for 25 minutes, rotating halfway through. This is the perfect time to make the cream cheese frosting. Into the bowl of our stand mixer goes 200 grams of powdered sugar, 80 grams or three quarters of a stick of butter at room temperature, 115 grams or half a block of cream cheese, also at room temperature, and a half teaspoon of kosher salt. Grab your wire whip and beat these guys together until they are smooth and creamy. Then we're going to stop and scrape down the sides of the bowl and the whip real quick and beat it together one more time, this time adding one to two tablespoons of heavy cream. You can add more or less, but we want this frosting to be pretty loose so that it drapes over the hot rolls. Speaking of which, it's been 25 minutes. The thickest part of our rolls is registering 195 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit and they're ready to rest in the pan for 10 minutes. Then we're carefully pulling them out by virtue of our parchment paper helper and immediately spreading evenly with frosting. You want to do this while the rolls are still hot so that the frosting drips down the sides and melts into the bun slightly to show off their twisty topography. And there you have it, homemade, hot, fresh, classic cinnamon rolls. Maybe one of my favorite recipes on earth and a great way to get some use out of that new stand mixer. But lest we forget the acronym F these rolls are a flexible form factor for fun fillings and frostings. So how about some strawberry Nutella rolls? Same dough recipe, but this time instead of butter and cinnamon sugar, we're generously painting the dough with Nutella, leaving a one inch border at the far edge. It's gonna help us seal the roll shut and prevent things from getting too smeary. Attempt and fail to resist to lick the offset spatula, roll things up tight, and then it's pretty much the same procedure as before. The only notable difference being that you're gonna wanna wipe your knife down with a wet kitchen towel between each slice. If you've got excess chocolate on the blade, it's gonna smear across the top of each each roll and ruin your aesthetic. Arrange, proof for one to one and a half hours, and bake as before. Now I figured the best place to introduce the strawberry flavor would be in the frosting. And I'm gonna do this with one ounce of freeze-dried strawberries, which I'm going to process in a food processor into a fine strawberry powder that I can work into the frosting. Strawberry smoke, don't breathe this. To make the frosting, it's pretty much the same procedure as before, but this time we are of course adding the sifted strawberry powder. Now not only are we adding a whole lot more powder to this mixture, it's powder that's specifically moisture absorbed Absorbent. So we're going to need to cut it with a lot more heavy cream. I ended up adding about half a cup. Ideally, we're trying to achieve the same consistency as our regular cream cheese frosting so that it still melts over the rolls without looking too gloopy. Now with that done, our rolls are headed out of the oven. Probably the best looking rolls I've ever made. The cleaner and flatter your cuts, the more consistent results you're going to get like this. Let them cool for 10 minutes, yank them out, and frost as before. Now, I guess I was a bit of a coward with the heavy cream because things didn't melt quite as picturesquely as the last batch, but flavor-wise, these things are a triumph. It's everything you love about Nutella strawberry crepes with the welcome addition of more butter and bread. Last but not least, it's that time of year again. Buckle up for pumpkin spice everything, including cinnamon rolls. To make our pumpkin spice, we're combining 50 grams of light brown sugar, 80 grams of granulated sugar, one tablespoon ground cinnamon, one teaspoon ground ginger, half teaspoon ground cardamom, quarter teaspoon allspice, quarter teaspoon kosher salt, eighth of a teaspoon of clove, and half a teaspoon of freshly grated nutmeg. I don't know why this is called pumpkin spice. Could be anything spice, really. Apple pie apple cider donuts, other apple stuff. Then once we've rolled out our dough, instead of using butter as our spice glue, why not use pumpkin puree? About 250 grams worth are just enough to apply a thin pastiche like we did the Nutella. Spread it on, spice it down, and then it's business as usual. Roll, slice, arrange, proof, bake, and frost. After proofing, however, I am going to do something I forgot to do with the original cinnamon rolls, that is brush them down with melted butter. I don't think this would work with the Nutella rolls because it would smear the chocolate everywhere, but for pumpkin or cinnamon, it works like a charm. Bake those off, and while they're in the oven, once again, we can contend with our frosting. And if these are going to be pumpkin spice latte cinnamon rolls, then they should probably have a coffee element. So I'm adding one teaspoon of instant coffee to our two tablespoons of heavy cream, mixing until dissolved and adding to the frosting as before. And as it turns out, coffee and cream cheese icing, really, really good. So let's see how it plays with pumpkin, a combination I've never really understood myself. Now, as you can see, my rolls are a little all over the place. I think I cut them sloppily and they rose a little bit too much due to underproofing. But with a little bit of cooling and a whole lot 
a frosting, they look pretty, pretty good. And to my surprise and delight, they taste even better. The pumpkin's really subtle and it doesn't taste artificial because it's not, and the spices work surprisingly well with the coffee. So add me to the pumpkin spice train. I'm on board. Just a reminder, my new cookbook, Basics with Babish, is coming out October 24th. This recipe and over 100 others are laid out in mouthwatering detail with a healthy dose of humor, honesty, and vulnerability. Pre-order now and be sure to grab tickets to my book tour at bingingwithbabish.com slash book tour.